We've had a wonderful start to Hofstra's 13th presidential conference with outstanding panels and conversations examining and analyzing the presidency of Barack Obama. The panels have provided great insight and behind the scenes detail about Obama as a president, as a politician, and a person navigating his role and his relationships leading this country as the first black president. We heard from political scientists, historians, journalists, political strategists, members of the media, a member of Congress, and members of the Obama administration who shared their perspectives on the many issues that arose during Obama's presidency, and there will be more tomorrow. It has been a most stimulating and interesting day, and I thank all of our speakers for their openness and generosity with their knowledge and their expertise. And now I am delighted to welcome Hofstra's Joseph G. Astman Distinguished Conference Scholar, Dr. Melissa Harris Perry, to present the conference keynote presentation in conversation with Dr. Mina Bose. Dr. Bose, as most of you know, is the director of the Peter S. Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency, the Peter S. Calico Chair in Presidential Studies, a professor of political science, and the Obama Conference Director. She has other titles as well, but I thought we should get on with the evening. Hmm? Um, now, Dr. Harris Perry is the Maya Angelou Presidential Chair at Wake Forest University and is a member of the Departments of Political Politics and International Affairs, of Women and Gender Studies, and the Program in Environment, in Environment and Sustainability. She teaches courses in American politics at the intersection of race, place, and gender. Dr. Harris Perry is also a writer, a political commentator, and a television host. She is currently the host of The Takeaway, a syndicated in-depth news show on National Public Radio. This evening, we will hear Dr. Harris Perry's first-person account of witnessing Barack Obama's political journey from as early as his 2004 campaign for the US Senate. At that time, Dr. Harris Perry was a political scientist at the University of Chicago, and the world was just beginning to hear of Barack Obama as he made his impassioned speech at the, at the Democratic National Convention. Dr. Harris Perry will share her insight into Obama's political abilities, communication skills, and vision for American politics. Earlier today, uh, Dr. Harris Perry met with students from the Lawrence Herbert School of Communication, the Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy, and International Affairs, and the Office of Student Leadership and Engagement. She also stopped by my office for a, a very stimulating uh, conversation with me and some of my colleagues. So uh, we're in for a very interesting evening. We very much appreciate her willingness to spend time with our students and our president and share details about her career journey. It is important for our students to hear from people who are deeply involved in the conversations that impact our world. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Melissa Harris Perry in conversation with Mina Bose. Thank you, President Poser. Melissa, Dr. Harris Perry, it is such an honor to have you here tonight. When our conference committee began discussing the keynote, a keynote address for the Obama conference, your name came to mind immediately. And I have to say that my colleagues are much more kind of confident than I am because I said, there's no way. We'll never be able to connect with her. And um, when I got the email um, from your office, uh, from Melissa saying, we'd love to do it. I just thought this is a good sign. This conference is going to come together. So it is just truly a delight to have you here. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, Thank you for the invitation. And I will say I, you know, I'm like live that kind of one day at a time thing. So it took me until sort of early this week to realize what I, I was saying to you before, three days and all of the extraordinary people. So I said yes before even realizing how happy I am that I said yes, but I'm very <laughs> happy to have said yes. Well, we're very glad that you're here. And I have had um, the pleasure of spending some time with you today. And I think I told you I've um, 
I've re reworked my question many times because there are so many topics to discuss. And as much as you've spoken with students, with scholars here, in this address, where some people have heard from you today, but not all, um, we'd really like to take this opportunity for you as the Joseph G. Aspen Distinguished Conference Scholar to share with us your assessment of President Obama's leadership, policymaking, and legacy. And you bring multiple perspectives to that as a political scientist um, who studies grassroots mobilization, um, social movements, race in American politics, and as a commentator, um, and as someone who has been highly engaged in politics throughout your political career, which I've followed since you were a professor at the University of Chicago. So I wanted to start at the beginning, but I think I'm going to reverse this, because um, <laughs> maybe we can move backward from, as, as a political scientist and as a journalist, as a commentator, as an activist, as kind of a passionate American of, of kind of what, what needs to be done, how do you place the, American, the Obama presidency in American politics? We're looking at it five years from now, five years ago, six years ago. How will we view the Amer how do you think the Obama presidency will be remembered in American politics? Its contributions, shortcomings, what is your assessment? So I'll defer to having a very best friend who is an American historian um, who writes about the turn of the 20th century. Um, and we became best friends. So my, my bestie in the world is um, uh, Blair Kelly. So some of you may know the work of Professor Blair Kelly. Um, but we met when we were both graduate students and, and didn't know a lot of things about a lot of things. Um, and at the time, um, Professor Kelly, then graduate student, Murphy said, um, you know, she, her plan was to study um, the Panthers, the Black Panthers. And so we would go to these conferences. She was presenting on the Panthers. And the Panthers were constantly there, OK? So like she's presenting on her research about the Black Panthers, about the beginning of them, about what happened. And, but invariably, there'd be a Panther in the audience. And they'd raise their hand and say, no, ma'am. I was at that meeting, and here's what happened. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so we get to about year three of graduate school, and Blair is like, oh. I'm going to study only people who are dead. <laughs> this has to stop. I cannot, if I'm going to be a serious historian and bring some historical perspective, we need to move back another 70 to 80 years. And so thank goodness, because she's a brilliant historian of the turn of the 20th century. So I'm going to recall that almost no one is dead from this administration. And in fact, the vice president of this administration is currently the president of the United States. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull back a little bit on what history is going to say, in part because it turned out George W. Bush was right when he was like, y'all going to miss me. We were like, no, we're not. And they were like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> y'all remember how happy you were when you saw George W. at the Trump inauguration? You were like, yay, hey, George, you look like you're having a good time. It's all good. Great. You and Dick. Great. We remember those years. So... <laughs> So I want to be really careful because whatever I think is going to be wrong in five years, right? Um, it's just the, the, the speed with which the world changes and then also our own um, understanding of it. So I'm not quite sure what history will think. Um, I was so appreciative of the early panel. I can't remember who was remembering this for us, but recalling that there came a point when we knew history would be made, right? When, when the Democratic nominee was either going to be Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, right? Um, and so we knew that there would either be the first black or the first white woman um, to be the nominee of the, um, of the Democratic Party. And then after McCain chooses Palin, we know that a woman is going to the White House, right, either as vice president, um, uh, excuse me, that we're either gonna have a history-making vice president or a history-making um, president. Everybody's like, wait, there's a woman on that? No. So, so there are moments when we know history is being made. I think all of us knew that. November of 2008. It was interesting to hear when we were talking with the students um, and all of the adults, uh, all the faculty, all the old, all of us who are not involved right now, were like, "Here's where I was that night. Here's where I was that night. Here's where I like." We can't help ourselves but to tell those stories. So we knew history was being made, but exactly what we will make of that history, I think I'm not, I'm not certain yet. Um, 
and particularly because he's such a young president and therefore such a young former president, we're gonna, he's going to keep, he's either going to really make his legacy fantastic or we're gonna really hate him by the time it's over because he's not going to stand still. But, right, John, the John Lewis who passes isn't the John Lewis stand, right? We come to love John Lewis more with greater depth, with greater understanding of his capacity over his decades of leadership. Julian Bond, we still like. Andrew Young, we like side eye. <laughs> King, we revere because he's gone. But President Obama's not gone. So I'm going to, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. Thank you. Well, it's a challenge. This is something we were discussing in the morning about um, early assessments. And, and the benefit of doing an assessment five, six years out is that we can bring together scholars, journalists, administration officials to kind of engage in discussion as we've been doing today. But in some ways, the story is yet to be written. It's not just the archival record, but the long-term effects of the policies and, um, and kind of what the long view of history is. If we go back to the beginning, um, you were in Chicago when Barack Obama ran for the Senate and um, had kind of an unexpectedly um, kind of clear route to the Democratic nomination and then to the Senate victory. Um, gained national attention for his speech at the Democratic, his keynote at the Democratic National Convention. Did you see signs as someone who was living and working, studying, teaching political science in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, that this was a future president? Uh, no, of course not. He's black. <laughs> so, I mean, no. Like, I, okay. The first political experience I had with Barack Obama was not the 2004 presidential election. The first political experience I had with Barack Obama was the 2000 House race against Congressman Bobby Rush in the second congressional district of um, Illinois, where he lost his entire, I'm sorry, I'm very, um, I curse like a sailor. Um, I, I do try to um, not, um, <laughs> particularly if we have ASL, because um, I don't, really want to make ASL interpreters curse. Um, but I am tired, so the cursing may get worse, but I'll try to hold it back. So um, he lost his, he lost badly um, in that race. So my first encounter was I was a brand new junior faculty member at the University of Chicago. You know, you show up, you do things like, <laughs> like I got a um, subscription to the Tribune and Michael Dawson, my chair was like, oh my God, girl, do you know nothing? We do not read the Tribune. That is not what the blacks read. The blacks we read that. I was like, oh, okay, all right, let me get the other paper then, right? Like, so all the things I had to understand about which team to root for, he was like, we're not Cubs fans. <laughs> Socks, my friend. So like all the things. But one of the things I was being acculturated to was we've got this terrific young state senator and he's running for the house and he's so smart. Great, he is, he's so smart. And the only people who voted for him, I might've been the only black person who voted for him because like it was the Hyde Park, liberal progressive whites, and, and maybe me, because I had just gotten there. And all the black folks in town were like, no, sir, you over Panther Bobby Rush. He's probably one of the Panthers coming to the talk. So I watched him lose badly and be really annoyed. So Barack Obama is almost always the smartest person in the room by two standard deviations. It's not absolutely always true, but certainly in, in a congressional race on the South side in 2000, he is the smartest. And in 2000, on the South side of Chicago, he let you know he was the smartest. He, he, the way he sat, the way he talked, the amount of air that he took up. So um, if you're an Obama watcher, you'll know that by the time he's in the, at the presidency, he develops a tick of putting his hands over his lips, right? And so that is a strategy that he develops to shut up and not be the smartest person in the room, okay? So, so stick with me for a second. So the, my first political encounter is watching him lose and watching him lose because he's inauthentically and insufficiently black for the South Side of Chicago, which wants a very particular kind of representation at the congressional level. So I think you all will talk about this um, um, on the panel that your colleague, um, Professor Lightfoot, will um, be leading on Friday. Um, but that was a gift 
of, the, of black voters on the South Side to Barack Obama, not only because it kept him from being stuck in the House, but also because it taught him something about how to campaign and how to right, appeal to the black voters who are at the center of his story. The second encounter I had with him was a personal encounter. His wife, not yet First Lady Obama, at that point Michelle Obama, who ran the University Community Service Center at the University of Chicago. And I teach a lot of classes that have like student learning in the community. So I come in, I like to say, it's not true, but I like to say, yo, yeah, First Lady Obama was my staff member when I was at University of Chicago. <laughs> she's not, she's a whole other person. It was, it's just a fun little ditty you say to your children when they tell you to make a sandwich. And you're like, you know, the First Lady used to work for me. <laughs> but I went to meet with her and we were having this incredible conversation and I'm leaning forward because she's fascinating and he came in and he like barocked on it. He was like, you know, came in and did what boys do when they walk in the room and they take up all the room and I'm like, oh my God, didn't you lose? Please shut up. <laughs> so I know many people met or saw or experienced Barack Obama and thought he's going to be president. I met, saw, experienced Barack Obama and thought, thank God he married Michelle because that's gonna be the best thing that's ever gonna happen for him. Now, it turns out I am right about that analysis, but hold on for a second. All right, so I know I went back a little bit further, but I do think that's important. So by the time we get to 2004, he has figured out how to run better. He's figured out, how, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more moment between 2000 and 2004. Um, he gave the Martin Luther King address at the University of Chicago and it was bad, it was boring. It was very policy and it was very boring. It was like, and then the next year I happened to give that speech and mine was very good. <laughs> and so I remember thinking, that dude, like, I'm so much better than him. Now, I want you to hold that for a second because I'm not the only person who thinks that, right? So Bobby Rush is like, I whooped that dude, right? Melissa Harris Perry in like her third year as an assistant faculty member, I ain't even read any real books yet, certainly hasn't written one. I'm thinking I'm better than him. What Barack Obama has that I haven't ever seen in another candidate, although I haven't been as close before, is he moves up a learning curve with extraordinary speed. So when I talk about him being the smartest person in the room, it's not just like um, uh, exogenous knowledge that he has from being a law professor or any of these things, it's his capacity to read, to understand, to fail, and then to not make that mistake ever again, right? So he'll make more mistakes, but not that one. So we get to 2004, he's a much better campaigner, he's doing his thing, but I heard on the earlier panel, someone said, um, this is the reason Barack Obama won, you know, whatever, the presidency. But I know the most important person in the Extraordinary journey that becomes President Barack Obama. Does anybody watch Star Trek? Does anybody know Jerry Ryan? She plays seven of nines. Jerry Ryan is the reason that Barack Obama became president, and here is why. Jerry Ryan, who's a very beautiful white woman with big, long, fancy hair, very fancy, she's like on the Star Trek, was married to a man who whose name is Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan won the Republican nomination for the US Senate. Okay, so all this stuff had happened, like the, the, the ice cream guy, Oberweiss, I can't remember, he stole some money or touched somebody or something, but he was out. And there was some other guy who was out. And so Barack wins the Democratic nomination for the US Senate from Illinois, but he's not, He's not Daly's guy. He's not like the, the, like the Chicago guy. So people are still kind of like, meh. And Jack Ryan, who is this young white man, wins the Republican nomination. Now, if you know anything about the Illinois Republican Party, they're a hot mess. But this guy, he's young. He was an investment banker who gave up Wall Street and was teaching at Hales Franciscan, an all black male private school on the South Side. On the night that he wins, this young Republican white guy, he's got all these black teenagers behind him. They're ch it is about to be a race. Like, like Barack Obama might win this sucker, but he's going to have to win it. He's going to have to beat Jack Ryan, who is doing all, he's young, he's raising money. Um, I remember walking the, um, uh, the breast cancer walk that year. He's out shaking hands, no Barack Obama around, but there's Jack Ryan. But here's how Jerry Ryan comes into the story. Jerry Ryan is Jack Ryan's ex-wife. And the reason she's Jack Ryan's 
ex-wife is because he took her to a sex club when they were married and she didn't like it, so she divorced him. Now, when I tell my students that, they're like, this is a scandal? <laughs> because notice he didn't take the nanny, he didn't take his underage, right? He took his wife, his wife was like, nah, dog, I'm out. She divorced him, but in 2004, this is a scandal and Jack Ryan drops out of the race. Now, any slightly together Republican party would have picked somebody to live in the state of Illinois. These people are, Judy Bart's Pink and all of them don't even know what to do with themselves. They're like, oh my God, there's a black guy running. We need kryptonite. Let's go get Alan Keyes. <laughs> so they go to get Alan Keyes, who is somehow supposed, like this dude has lived in Maryland and says wild things. Just, well, although I did always enjoy him because anytime reparations would come up, he would say, yes, I believe in reparations and he's not eligible. Right, everybody's like, oh, Alan Keyes brought some analysis. Okay, so there was all of this, but here's, and I'm gonna stop. Because he did not actually have to run for the US Senate. So again, he may have won the US Senate, even against Jack Ryan, because again, the Republican Party in Illinois was a mess, still kind of is. But he would have had to run that race. He would have had to raise money for himself. He would have had to have been in the state. All y'all who saw him for the first time in 2004 speaking at the DNC, why in the world would a candidate be speaking at the DNC in that keynote moment? He wasn't really running for the US Senate. It was, I mean, he had a like 80 to 20 lead at all points. He was going to win that race. Oh my God, Reed, sorry, just wanna make sure. Harry Reed is like, <laughs> I like that dude. Come around with me, sir, and let's make some rain. So during 2004, he first, he gives the big speech. There's no red America, there's no blue America, there's just the United States of America. He steals a little bit of Michelle's story. I'm a skinny kid from the South Side. No, sir, no, you're not. <laughs> Michelle Obama's a skinny kid from the South Side. You're a funny name dude from Hawaii, but it's good. We love you, we're down. World gets to see him. Hillary Clinton, go back and watch that video. They pan up to Hillary Clinton, and she's like, there's my vice president. <laughs> All right, Barack, let's do it. We going to, she was like, you could see it. She was like, oh, there you go. Cause that, that Harold Ford dude, that's not working out, but how about you? So when you asked, did I know? No, because I thought he was like a little over talky because I'd seen him lose. And because when I saw him win, I saw him win against a non-entity. Like I'd, I'd take my shot against Alan Keyes. I didn't realize until later how much it's not, cause I, the speech is fine, but it's not the speech because Harold had given the speech four years before. And he's a little light-skinned boy from the South, and they thought he was gonna win, you know. It's Jerry Ryan leaves Jack Ryan, leaves that door open for Obama. Harry Reid notices that this dude can make rain, and so before he even hits the Senate floor, he's making rain for Democrats all over the country. Why? because black voters are what matters, and you cannot win without us, and you cannot win without us, and you cannot win without us. And even when what you're trying to do is primarily get white voters, you still have to signal that somehow by voting for this candidate, you are a non-racist white voter. And so in order to be able to signal that, you still need us. So Barack Obama is going around the country both turning out the base and providing the market signal for white non-racism, so by the time he hits the Senate floor, people owe him favors, which is the only way you can go against the Clinton machine. So thank you, Seven of Nines, Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is, it's an amazing story of Obama from 2000, where I believe after he lost um, the primary for the, uh, for the House race, he went to the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles, and as I recall, I think the story is his credit card got rejected. He went, couldn't get into the conference hall, no convention hall, nobody knew him, left. Um, and then this learning curve that you point, we, there have been comparisons made to Kennedy today, and Kennedy, John F. Kennedy was not a naturally gifted communicator, but, but really worked on that um, in his uh, time, his three terms in the House, to really build the, the skills that he had, and, and now we cite him regularly, as with uh, Barack Obama. 
except yeah. nobody ever so so here's the black part he's moving up that learning curve in part because it's survival skill 101 when you're black and because no no matter whether or not jack kennedy was going to be president he was still always going to be jack kennedy nobody ever rejected his like he was always going to have a place Barack Obama could have been your favorite law professor at the University of Chicago. Like that is a very real trajectory that like, like you're a state senator holding it down in Illinois. Like he, like, and sorry. And all of us who thought we were better than him were a little annoyed because he leapfrogged everyone. Like, <laughs> I mean, everybody. The notion that that dude is the one who becomes president? I mean, again, think about, I love media analysis, right? They kept putting the camera on Jesse Jackson on um, election night, and he's crying, and you don't quite know why. <laughs> <laughs> like, a little bit of it is like, he's like, oh, Barack Obama, and a little bit of it is like, this and I, him? <laughs> him. That's the one. But, so yes, so yes, Jack Kennedy has the learning curve, but there, I just, so often when we talk about President Obama and race, it's like we want to talk about it only if he explicitly like came to give a, a, an address about race. But for me, that moment of like being rejected at the 2000, even if you don't know that story, that story sits on him residually in ways that make him legible for black voters, that make him legible to black and brown communities, that make him legible to all, to young folks, right? Who, because his swagger, that walk that he does initially, is the walk of somebody shut out who gets in, which is a little bit different than the person who's always in. No, that's, that's an important point. We were talking about this earlier where um, President Obama was criticized by some for not engaging questions of race, right, and, and race relations. And you mentioned that after hearing this morning's conversations that, that you heard race in much of his communications and his decisions. Could you, could you elaborate? Because I think it's, it's that's, not an, that's not an explanation that's traditionally given. In fact, more that President Obama won by fitting his narrative, his background, his childhood, his, um, academic career, entry into politics, state senate, and government, as part of the American dream. That this is kind of right, that we, the emphasis on unity. We can move past traditional divisions, uh, move past, bipart uh, have bipartisanship. We can come together, the 2004 speech, the fierce urgency of now in 2007 in Iowa, uh, his inaugural address. Was there more there that people weren't seeing or more messaging that, that perhaps we were perhaps overly simplifying kind of the methods of unity. But what could be blacker than the story you just told? Um, I have a very advanced case of ancestor worship. I love my ancestors a lot. And I think about them a lot. And I think about my ancestors who spend centuries in intergenerational chattel bondage. And then the first thing we do, there's two first things we do at the moment of emancipation, right? So emancipated without no land, <laughs> without any money, without any resources, we do two things. First, we go look for our families, right? So these ex extraordinary books and, and historical studies about how we just start walking looking for our people. We just literally just imagine, I mean, this baby who just got shot. But just imagine you don't know where your babies are. And so they're like, they went that way. 15 years ago, cool, I'm gonna walk that way. till I find, so the first thing we do is for our people are, and the second thing we do is run for office. Now let me just suggest, my ancestors are better than me. And you know when we say better than me, we don't, we're like, you crazy girl. The, they run for office. I'm gonna say it again because it, it, it sometimes misses people who have had the privilege of citizenship. 
that the first thing you do after hundreds of years of chattel intergenerational bondage, where you expected nothing but bondage for yourself and for your children, where none of your labor accrued back to you, is to run for office. There is no one who believes the American dream more than us. Please go back and look again at the photographs of my people on the roof of the house in Katrina over and over and over again. We were up there, and this is, remember, three years before Barack Obama is the president of the United States. We're up on the roof needing assistance, and what do we have? What do we have? What, do y'all remember what we had on the roof? I mean, yes, we took our weapons, because it's Louisiana. What else did we take? We took American flags. And it took me a while, because I'm looking at these flags, and I'm like, okay, because you know, when you live in flood zone, you have things that you're going to grab every time, right? So there's just, I mean, not that anyone knew the levees were going to break in this way, but there are things that you grab. Think to yourself, if you had five minutes, if you heard the levee break, you see the water coming down the street, what do you take as you go up? So if, you, if you're smart, you take your firearm because you're, you're going to need that. You hopefully maybe grab some water. Maybe there's a family album. What is the flag? Again, who, we, don't, we don't really do Fourth of July like that. So what is the flag? What is the flag that people have on their roof? What is the flag that you can put your hands on like that? What is it? Somebody in here must know what that flag is. What's the flag sitting somewhere where you know you can put your hands on it and it matters to you to take it with you to the roof? It, it is a family member who has died. It is the flag they handed you at the graveside. So we went on the roof with the flag, which is an actual physical representation of our contribution of paying the ultimate price for the country, which we've been doing since the Civil War, since the Revolutionary War, and we get called refugees, which is not a bad word, but just an inaccurate one. Think of Frederick Douglass, who in what does 4th of July mean to the enslaved, the whole first part of it is about how badass the American project is. Right? The whole first part is, I assume that just like everything else that Jefferson stole from all of his black enslaved people, like French fries and ice cream. If you go to Mount Rushmore, they tell you Jefferson created ice cream. That's a lie, James Hemings did. Oh God, I feel like we just need to start at the beginning of the syllabus, right? <laughs> James Hemings, James Hemings, who is Sally Hemings' brother, who's with them in France, who is the only American chef trained as a French chef, who comes back because Sally's pregnant, with Jefferson's baby, and so it's the only reason y'all got French fries in the Americas is because of James. I'm not, I, that sounds like an exaggeration, and sometimes I'm silly, but I'm being dead serious, right? That's all James Hemings. So I'm assuming he also was chatting up with his enslaved people when he writes the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all persons are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Who thinks that but enslaved people? Surely no enslaver takes it as self-evident that all people are created equal. Certainly Jefferson, who owned his own children, did not take it as self-evident that all persons are created equal. But he is chatting it up because Sally Hemings lives with him and they chill it and Dolly Madison is naming one of the kids James and stuff like that, like that all happened. So presumably, all of that, that is all, all of it's ours. So for me, when I hear a black man say, yes, we can. Like, I, well, I don't even believe when white people say it. I'm like, well, sure, you can, you white, dude, whatever, okay, whatever. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm over-exaggerating a bit, but the story, the story of Frederick Douglass, the story of my enslaved people who get out to freedom and then vote, the story of James Hemings who comes back and comes back and then brings us all the good stuff despite the fact that he doesn't himself benefit from it. For me, that is the black, it's like black me, black, black, black on Sunday, black on Tuesday, black on Wednesday. So I understand why people who think of black people as oppositional can't hear that when a black person is doing the American Jeremiah, that they are actually doing blackness. But I think it is highly legible to black audiences who know that that particular version of hope, and he also says hope, not happiness, not goodness, not wealth, hope. And hope is the story of were you there at the cross when they crucified my Lord? And the reason, right, that the encounter with Jesus is the 
definitive religious encounter isn't because Jesus is true or not true or whatever, but because that story sounds right if you are enslaved. Oh, right? That story resonates. You're like, ah, not the kings coming to overturn the law. Because of course the law at that point is again, so of course, of course you move towards the divine that is crucified, put in the electric chair, killed by the state. Of course you do. That's the definitive encounter. So for me, when I talk about Obama talking race all the time, I see him performing a very long line of black political and religious and racial Jeremiah that is an encounter with the aspiration of the American project that I think actually uniquely black folks have. But then let me finish on this real quick. And also, he must have borrowed that. Because his story, and I'm sure he must have some ancestor worship too, but his people weren't enslaved. So it's a little bit his story, but a lot of it is her story. And therefore his children's story that he comes to learn and appreciate and replicate. He's also doing, as Bill Clinton did, lots of performances of blackness, although Bill's actually better at it than Barack, at least early on. <laughs> <laughs> kind of amazing. I mean, President Obama gets really good at it by the time he's in Charleston and he sings, right? But I have, with my own eyes, seen Bill Clinton sing all three verses of Lift Every Voice and Sing Without Looking at the Words. And I, and I, I would challenge most of the Congressional Black Caucus to do that. <laughs> so for me, he is doing race all the time. Um, yes, we can, as a spe speech of defeat, although he is not himself writing that, because it's like also blows my mind, it's like a little baby white boy writes that. It's kind of amazing, right? But his delivery of it, that he loses and says, yes, we can, I only know black, like black people are the only people I know who do that. Like, oh, we lost, cool, and we on the right track. <laughs> so that feels very profoundly black. He just was, and I'll stop, I'm sorry. To me, the fact that so many of us who have talked about him today in the context of the 08 campaign, read him so differently, is the genius and problem of that campaign, but really the genius of it, is that, you know, we've talked about this before as the green screen, right? So I think my reading is an authentic one. I also think Karen Finney's reading of like Barack Obama as the great, you know, multiracial, like that's a different reading that I have, right? So because for me, like all black people code switch, so it's not like you ain't gotta have a white mama to code switch, but I also get why, right, you, right? I had a conversation with um, our colleague um, earlier who talked about him as the great internationalist, right? And I was like, he certainly wasn't leaning to so international when his name is Barack Hussein Obama, but you could, like, all these people, like, at the point at which, like, remember when Colin Powell was like, I'm gonna vote for Obama? Didn't you for a minute think, well, what do you see? Right, like, like Colin Powell saw something in Obama that I know is different from what I, what I saw. But Colin Powell authentically saw it, so they cultivated a green screen so that we could all project ourselves, our goals, our thing. And for us, for black women, who are the actual meaningful voting category that gave Obama 08 and then returned him in 2012, and I remember the night they did, October 3rd, it was in part seeing that he was married to a woman as tall as him, as smart as him and black from a distance. Because what we understood is the sexual and mating choices that the first black editor of the Harvard Law Review had and his willingness to choose, now this is all very patriarchal language, right? But this is right, to choose, to continue to like, to affirm, like it meant something to all of us that you know he knows what a relaxer smells like. <laughs> What a head wrap look. I mean, it, it was like a thing like, oh, my president knows what a hot comb is. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, think, I don't think ABC News caught that. I think they missed that altogether, but we knew. <laughs> okay. 
I think there are going to be a lot of audience questions, so I'm going to restrict myself. <laughs> yes, some to be like, what is the hot dog? <laughs> well, but the point is, Barack knows. <laughs> well, let me ask a couple of policy questions, sure. and then maybe we'll move. Then we'll, because, because I think you've described the election and um, Obama's communications and the message in, in such a, a rich and kind of deep way, more so, I think, than in many of the, much of the extensive, extensive coverage at the time did. When it comes to policy making, so Obama enters office with this, these promises of hope and change and expectations are so high, election night 2008, I mean it's a historic moment in American politics. Uh, under 30 year olds deliver the vote for Obama, brings out kind of this grassroots mobilization and, and has significant successes in his first term. But has difficulty moving beyond the traditional political divisions, as he promised. What do you see, were those missed opportunities? Was that leadership, was that institutions, a combination? How do you see it? So, to be fair, I'm a public opinion researcher, right? So I'm always gonna see um, presidents through the lens of the public, as opposed to the really, I thought, fascinating and brilliant things that we got from insiders, right? So um, I'd seen the anger of congressional black caucus members um, ab about President Obama and feeling like they were being left out. I didn't realize it was a whole House of Representatives thing, right, until I heard Congressman Israel talking about it. I was like, oh, well, that is fascinating, right? So I'd seen that irritation, and I always thought it was the thing where we thought we were at least as good or better, and then he just jumped, you know, leapfrogged over all of us, right? And so I say us. I just thought I gave a better speech, which I now don't, right? But like, <laughs> like if you're Maxine Waters, right, you know, you're still auntie to Barack Obama. I don't care if you're in the White House, I'm auntie, right? So you still have you know, respect due. So I'd seen that, but I didn't have that insider perspective. Um, as much as I just talked about Barack Obama the human, I will say as a political scientist, I put that hat on, probably none of that had anything to do with why he won the presidency. The, him winning the presidency, I think again, as we heard, I, think from Congressman Israel was already structurally overdetermined, right? So, um, you know, whenever you're trying to predict something, right, you should just start with the simplest answer of a model that works. It may not be explanatory, but it doesn't mean it's not strongly predictive. So the, the strongest predictive model in the post-1960 era is the tall guy wins, right? So just like tall guy wins, tall guy wins. We don't know why. That's not an explanatory model, but it's a very good predictive model. You're going to get that almost every time. Tall guy wins. I still think it's why he picked Joe Biden, because <laughs> together they were very <laughs> tall. <laughs> and they overcame the fact that the bumper sticker looked like it said Osama bin Laden, <laughs> which at the time struck me right. At the time, I was like, somebody is messing up, but nope. Okay. But all of that goes to campaign. Right? What you should be able to predict who wins the presidency based on a bunch of macro things. Like, I should be able to predict who's going to win the presidency kind of now ish, right? Maybe not now ish, but pretty soon, just based on macroeconomic measures, based on whether it's a first term or a second term president, right? Whether or not there's a, um, a long primary. Issue. Like, there's just a bunch of things that just have really strong predictive capacity. And then we, when we start talking about presidents, tell all of these stories about how good the winners are and how bad the losers are because we're just filling in the blanks, but actually that's probably trash, right? So I can tell you all of this about Barack Obama's campaign, but probably he just won because he was gonna win the primary because America hates women. And then once he won the primary, then he was gonna win because we'd had two terms of a Republican president and the economy was down and Katrina. So, <laughs> right, like, so, like, of course he won. But then governing, I think is similar. So you're a, first term president, deeply concerned about winning re-election, how much you gonna get done? I should be able to predict just how much you're gonna get done basically with a few measures. How do you have a majority in the House and in the Senate? If you do, how tight is that majority, right? Now, like for example, you don't even have a majority in the Senate unless you have 60, right? So 51 doesn't even constitute, right, in terms of the Senate kill switch that is the filibuster that's not quite in operation in the first part of Obama's time. When I look at, if I step back and I don't want to tell a story about leadership or quality or discourse, 
he got done more than should be expected, given what he had. And also about that much. One big, major legislative effort, right? One really big one, kind of, oh, right. And also there was a whole, the whole economy was crashing. So really maybe much more than we would have expected, right? So he like saves the economy. He doesn't personally, that's a trash explanation, right? But he starts with a bad economy. It's better by the time he, he's running for re-election, which is part of why he wins re-election. And he gets one big legislative effort through while he has a majority in the House. And then it's trash after that. So like that, that is actually, before we get to LBJ as master of the Senate, he probably is. He also still had all those Southern Democrats in the party. And then they left after him, right? Yeah, I mean, FDR was the man, but also everybody was a Democrat, everybody. Like if FDR couldn't, and he had a war, which means, you know, remember Bush got a lot done during the war because why? Rally around the flag, right? So I'm, I can tell you what I wish he'd done, but just in terms of like this one big major domestic effort, improve, you know, focus and improvement on the economy because it's the economy stupid, Enough messaging to hold the base so that when he screws up on October 3rd, uh, 2012, black women are like, oh God, let's go get Michelle's husband. And then <laughs> he can win re-election. Enough relationship building that at least it doesn't um, spill over, but he loses big in the midterm because of the parts that we already heard um, earlier this morning. So I think, I mean, it sort of feels like, yeah, well, about right. I have so many more questions. I'll, 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 uh, I'll end with one and then we'll open, maybe we'll get to some of them in the, question, in the Q and A. Um, does Obama, when Obama leaves office, the country's clearly divided in 2017, right? We see that in the 2016 elections. Was that building throughout Obama's presidency? Was it, what, what were the promises and the, the kind of maybe the gap between the expectations and the reality did that further some of the divisions? President Obama in his opening address said there are two ways to judge a presidency. He didn't quite say it that way, but he was like, there's kind of two things you really have control over. The rest is Nancy Pelosi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> storytelling, right? Um, and I think part of the reason I can tell so many stories about President Obama is because President Obama is a top five American storyteller, right? Especially presidential, right? So Lincoln, um, Reagan, FDR, Kennedy, Obama. Not necessarily in that order, but if I'm thinking about people um, who really can tell the American story. So, you know, if storytelling, top five. Then he said, and you're in a relay. Right? If you're a president, you're in a relay. Um, because it's only so much time, right? You've got eight years and you're out, unless you're FDR and you get more. The key to a relay, anyone who's ever run a relay, the key is what? Passing the baton, right? It's not even how fast you run or how, right? Passing the baton. In that one, he got to be bottom five. Trash. Now, I'm not saying it's his fault. I do think it is fault. But... <laughs> What presidents do, what second term president's job is, is to get their party reelected, right? Really only Reagan was good at this one, right? Reagan gave us HW. So this dude didn't just not give us a Democrat, right? You get Trump. And I think there are some things that the Obama administration does that, that are part of that. So if I'm thinking of him as a top five storyteller, I'd also say on the relay race, is the bottom five in terms of like what comes next. But the Trump presidency is a dependent variable. It's not the independent variable. It is not the mover. White supremacy doesn't need black people to achieve or to fail in order to reproduce itself. White supremacy reproduces itself just fine. Media told us in 2016, broadcast media, and a lot of media, that, um, president, that, that Donald Trump could never be president because he was kind of rapey and a racist. So again, why one should talk to black women. 
Because I'm sure black women were like, wait a minute, were there some presidents who weren't rapey and racist? Okay, name three non-rapey, not racist American presidents. Go. Right? Like the notion that it's a disqualification for the American presidency if you're a little rapey and racist is weird. Because in fact, for most of American history, being a little rapey and very racist is a prerequisite. Right? Even Bill Clinton teaches us that, um, that you're going to lose as a Democrat if you keep cuddling up to black folks. So you got to stiff arm Sister Soldier, you got to stiff arm Jesse Jackson, you have to exit black folks, right? Demonstrating your white supremacist bona fides is more the norm than not for winning the presidency. So I can't blame Trump on Obama being president because white supremacy just doesn't need a black president to do what it does, right? It reproduces itself separately because it has a value in reproducing itself. But each version of white supremacy is different. Not better or worse, different. New technologies, new ways of communicating, new outfits. So I think the Obama handoff, I think there are a few things he could have done in his final decision-making days around public policy and around campaign strategy that could have potentially helped to maybe give Hillary Clinton the win. I don't know for sure because I never thought she could win, but I do think that if they had nominated a black woman to the Supreme Court, specifically if they had nominated Anita Hill, that there was a real possibility Hillary Clinton could have won. And I can explain that if you're interested. And I do think once he knew that Trump was going to be president, he needed to do an executive order to shield DACA kids. So I do think there are specific things he did in the handoff that were fails. But for the most part, I can't lay Trump at the feet of Barack Obama because to do so would be to say that it is unsafe to be excellent and black because you will cause backlash. And I am unwilling to ever make that argument because I will say whether you are excellent or whether you are a failure, you being worried about, right, backlash from white supremacy is like, that's worse than like, oh, you remember early on they were like, oh, are you worried that Barack Obama will be assassinated, right? Like they'll either terrify you that we're gonna assassinate him or they'll terrify you, are you worried that you'll end up with a Donald Trump next? And we can't allow either one of those to be the core decision making in trying to come to a more aspirational version of American racial democracy. Thank you. Let's open up the discussion. We Although have, he probably shouldn't have like <laughs> trolled Trump at that uh, <laughs> at the press court. <laughs> that was wrong. That was that he went too far on that. But it was karma. Really, <laughs> well, we have microphones here and here. If anyone would like to come up, we haven't even talked about twenty twelve. Talk about what? 2012. No, I wanted to get to that, but term. I thought I would Right, no, no, I'm just, I'm, your interview, I'm suggesting oh. questions, which is silly. <laughs> Perfectly silly. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, so I'm actually also co-presenting with Dr. Lightfoot on yeah. Friday. Um, so, you, and I think Mina's last question about expectations, that's really kind of the foundation of our research, looking at what those expectations were. So I want to hear personally, so you told us about the 2000s, 2004, thinking you were better than Barack, I get it. Um, so I want to know, what were your personal expectations of him? And maybe outside of the really pragmatic, you know logistically what he might get done, but this is the first black president, so what were your expectations? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm ex-gen, I'm old. I'm like, <laughs> girl, I voted for John Kerry hard. I got other people. <laughs> Come on, we're gonna go vote for John Kerry now. Hey, I was gonna rock the vote. So I right, right. You see what I'm saying? Like, I'm very low. It was very cool, right? I mean, I I was a kid talking about Michael Scott. Okay, so 
I know, I know the Z-Gens have like expectations. Um, and, and I guess I'm enough of a political scientist to have not cared all that much who the president was. Like, I find the president, like, it's like I don't study the presidency, I study first ladies, right? Because I'm fascinated by how power operates in those ways, right? But like, um, I had no knowledge that I would care that there was a black president. All right, so let me, let me, the first two people, three people, so in 84 and 88, I was a kid, but I remember my parents' excitement about Jesse Jackson, and I remember thinking, that would be cool. And I remember, it was my first convention that I watched, like, because Michael Tukak is Jesse Jackson, and to me, it just sounded like Michael Jackson. <laughs> And I, I suppose if you'd asked me then at 10, 11, 12, I would have, you know, my version would be like a living color skit. Like, he's going to be up in there like, oh. it's like Key and Peele, right? It would have been a Key and Peele skit would have been, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to let you finish, but didn't people expect that? I don't think old black ladies did. Um, so were there some people? Sure. I'll get to them in 15 seconds. Okay. No. Okay. So... So, so I like to think of myself as an old black lady. Even before I was an old black lady, I'm, I'm really, oh, I can't wait because ancestor worship. So I'm the old black lady. I'm, I mean, children had me late on Easter Sunday. I was like, you wait till I'm really old. I'm not going to be late. So I was shocked that I was moved by his candidacy and by his win. I was genuinely surprised at how much it meant to me. Because, oh, because I'm sorry, because then they'd also talk about Harold Ford being president, and I was like, are you serious? And then they had talked about Colin Powell being president, and I was like, eek. So, and, not, and I actually really like Colin Powell, He's, but it didn't move, it didn't move me, right? And maybe it's because I had lived around the corner from him in Hyde Park, and I'd known Michelle, and I'd seen him lose and all that, that it felt more personal, but he moved me. He still does. It's a little silly old video where he like, made, I'm like, oh, it's like West Wing, it's like watching the, back remember when Jeff Bartlett was president, right? Like it, <laughs> right? So I don't know that I had expectations beyond, I mean, I was kind of like the Nobel Committee, right? Remember, Nobel gives him the Nobel Prize 15 minutes after becoming president, apparently for surviving. <laughs> yeah. They were like, dude, you did not get shot. Yes. So it wasn't even, it was really a Nobel Prize for Americans. They were like, white Americans, good job. <laughs> you didn't even try to shoot at him. Peace prize. Because I was like, what, what had he done? Nothing. Not because he was a bad person, he just hadn't actually done anything, right? Or maybe it was aspirational, now you can live into this, whatever, right? But I think I sort of felt more like that. Like, for me, it was that he bore up under the thing that was this, that he lived it. And like, I know apparently Congress didn't get to go to the White House, but do you know who did? I mean, straight up. My sister, my queer niece, my, my little dancer niece, my for the people who work for me, when I tell you the number of invitations that I was giving to other people, I mean, I don't, I guess Congress wasn't there, but we was up in that mug. I mean, it was crazy. And it was like, you know, there's that, there's that painting of George Washington, the Dolly Madison, not really her, her slave, saved during the War of 1812, right? And George Washington, he's standing like this. He's like, right? Okay. And it's an important painting, and she saved it so that the British didn't like drag it around on the streets the way we toppled that Saddam Hussein statue, right? Like, it mattered. It wasn't really her, it was her enslaved guy who got it up. Okay. I would stare at that thing every time we were at one of these Obama events because it would be going down, right? Like, black people just, like, singing gospel music. There, the first Christmas party, there was Hennessy. Don't make me get out my phone of my husband drinking Hennessy in the White House. And every time I would look up at that, at that George Washington painting, and to me, he was saying, the fuck is this? <laughs> Michelle Obama's first official portrait and she standing there, remember they give her such a hard time about her arms, they give her such a hard time about her behind, and she's standing there like this, so that her behind, right, you're looking at her straight on, but right, she's, she didn't put on a little shrug, a little sweat, right, her arms are out, and she is standing in front of a portrait of who? Not George. Who's the one we have an issue with, black women? Thomas Jefferson. Her first official portrait is standing in front of Thomas Jefferson. So for me, that was it. 
All the expectations I had was do that. Keep doing that. Keep having the founding fathers being like, the fuck is this? <laughs> because, because I figured all the rest were all the constraints, right? All the rest are all the constraints of politics. All the rest are the constraints. And so if you can do more than that, great. Oh, and healthcare? Cool, we with you. But all I really, for me, just internally, this is not for all, all I really needed was the representation. And it is the only time I was disappointed. So every time I had it, it was enough, personally, not enough in terms of all this. And every time he missed the opportunity to do it, and he missed it regularly for black girls and women, he would just miss it and miss it and miss it. And every time, it just was devastating. Because I think for me, it actually wasn't policy as long as he was about as good as any Democratic president. It was actually that I didn't even know I cared that my president had hair like mine, but it turned out I did. Thank you so much. You've been through. Um, wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Melissa Harris Perry. Um, and, uh, I love your reflections from multiple tiers of the intellectual traditions and the sociology and the biography of, of Obama. Um, one comment you made um, brought particular interest to me, and it was in response to uh, Dr. Bowles' question about the deeper messaging um, within Obama's portrayal or rhetoric around blackness, and you mentioned ancestor worship. Um, and that struck me because I recently did a study on the negrescence of Obama's intellectual history and uh, basically measuring uh, or any impact or relation between his racial identity and his thinking. And I found you know, something that corroborated what you said. You know, everything he's, almost everything he did was black. He sort of took from the black intellectual tradition, the social tradition from audacity of Pope, a Reverend Wright, um, yes, we can. I trace that back to uh, Sammy Davis Jr. Yes, I can from a song and book he wrote. And fired up, ready to go, right? Mm -hmm. So with that said, it, he was almost in a sense um, quite an insurgent, uh, more insurgent than many of us would, would think. Um, what impact do you think that has on um, the possibilities of other non-black or non-white um, people of color as um, presidents, and how would that? How do you think that impacts black the, the black community itself, and also white Americans for the future? Right, Du Bois's question. Right, um, he says you know some flutter around it, but there's always this question: How does it feel to be a problem? Right, that this is the, the double the double consciousness, the two ness is how does it feel to be a problem? Right, and so all humans have problems, right? No level of whiteness, wealth, cisgender, straightness, none of that can keep you as a human from having problems, right? Steve Jobs died young, right? It is to have problems. What Du Bois gave us is the notion that blackness doesn't mean you have problems, it means you are a problem, right? Um, for me, this is what's happening right now in our discourse and our mean-spirited, downright evil legislation around trans folks, right? Um, trans people, and particularly trans young people, are a problem. It's not that they have problems, it's that they are a problem for the state, right? We can't let them do things like use the bathroom, right, or get health care. Uteruses are a big problem. So especially after the 14th Amendment, because if your uterus runs around making people within the confines of the state, then they're citizens, right? So anchor babies and welfare babies, right? These are all problems, right? So Du Bois wasn't intersectional in this way, but his understanding of blackness, for me, what does it mean to be a problem? So Obama is a problem, right? He's a, he's a problem. He's a black guy who's president of the United States, and we are meant to be subjects, right? So initially enslaved and then subjects, right? So in the state, but not, not 
the state, right? My favorite Obama moments were always like the, the G8 and the G10s and stuff, because he just looked like all the rest of the world leaders. You're like, oh look, everybody in the world is like brownish, hmm. right? But, but that's not, like how would you know who the American president is if, he, if he's that color and went to school in Jakarta for a little while and stuff? Like, but where's the American? So I think that when you talk about the possibilities, I think we like to think of possibility as being like role modeling. We see Obama and think, I too shall run for office. Although like the Obama years make you think, I will never run for office, <laughs> right? Okay. But, but I, I say this whole point about being a problem because for me, the work of public blackness is so often simply dis to disrupt, to be publicly a problem, right? In ways that we can't always predict what that means. So I was talking earlier to the young people about for millennials who go out and choose Obama. They're like, they're grown and they pick him as their president. So my first, you know, like one I really, really picked, that was Bill Clinton. And I was like, I'm gonna get me some student loan debt relief. And then I didn't get student loan debt relief. But it didn't problematize anything for me because like I appreciated that he performed blackness, but I knew he wasn't of me. I knew he didn't see me quite the same way. So it was all good. For the young people who choose Obama, they do, I think, have expectations much higher than just confound the founding fathers, right? More than just disrupt. So when George Zimmerman is Stick with me, 15 seconds, sorry. I hate yeah, that I do I'm this, I can't, over. my brain. Like the first thing that happens is that the Cambridge police um, arrest Skip Gates, which is crazy. So think, imagine you're Skip Gates, right? I mean, don't embody that too much, but imagine you're Skip Gates, right? You're like, you're like the most important Negro in America, right? Whether or not the others know, you, you know, you are the Du Bois. You, you are actually somehow simultaneously Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, which is wild, <laughs> right? Like you run the machine, but you're at Harvard, wild, okay. And you are the one who throws the first fundraiser for Barack Obama on Martha's Vineyard. You introduce him to the money, because remember, this dude still got student loans, right, that he's coming up with, right, and so on. So you're introduced, you and your, your boy, um, Ariel Mutual Funds, John Rogers, right? So John Rogers, and so you got a big money guy and you got the intellectual guy and they're like, all the white boys who are like us have a president, we don't have a president, we gonna get us a president, all right? So you have just, you just, now the dude that you introduced, that you bundled for, that you did the thing, that you laid the credential, the Booker T. Washington, Du Bois credential on top of has just been elected president. And now you already a little swaggerlicious because none of the rest of us live in post-racial America, but Skip Gates has been living there since 87. <laughs> so you already a little swaggerlicious. You coming back from Martha's Vineyard, okay? Mm. You somehow don't have the keys to your house, so you're a driver. Your driver has brought you back from Martha's Vineyard to Cambridge. Don't have the keys. You go around the back. I mean, first of all, whose life is this? And then the police show up and arrest, they're gonna arrest you. They come into your house and, and they're like, hey, who are you? And you say, and they say, come and meet us on the front porch. And you, because you have Skip Gates, I'm like, I'll meet your mama on the front porch. And he said that. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what a citizen who just elected a president should be able to do, right? At the, immediately, immediately, the state says, no, we don't care that, that you've done this, you will not be citizens like everyone else. Yes, John Rogers, you've bundled the money. Yes, Skip Gates, you, but we will walk into your house and arrest you. Now, Obama wants to stay away from this. He says that the thing I love most is he used an adverb. The Cambridge police acted stupidly. He might have used the last adverb in public usage. <laughs> and next thing you know, he's gotta have a beer summit when they had, in fact, behaved stupidly. They had arrested Booker T. Washington. <laughs> That's dumb. You can see they don't want it to be about that. And then the entire presidency is about that. Because then Trayvon is killed. And then Zimmerman is acquitted. And then Tamir is killed. And then 
right? And he's got a black AG who's embodying all the things. He's got a second black AG. And Jay Johnson is the head of Homeland Security, and that dude's black. And the young people are like, you have to do more than confound the founding fathers. So these young people who had chosen that president, just like Skip Gates, who had done it at this other level who chose it, were like, I'll meet your mama on the front porch. And so when it happens, right? Michelle says, I'm not worried about him being assassinated because he's a black man. He could be killed at a gas station. He's never killed at a gas station, but Jordan Davis is. So when it happens, this generation, the millennials who have the risen expectations, who went out and chose a president, are like, it will not stand. We are the state. And we don't even have to dress up cute. We will come out as we are. We are coming out queer. We are coming out undocumented. We, DACA is not, DACA is given by these little United We Dreamers who write the legislation, imagine, who aren't even allowed in the White House to present the legislation because they're undocumented, have to meet in a church basement across the street from the White House to present the DACA information to President Obama's team. Because that generation, those millennials, were not having it because the expectations rose and they got a perfectly regular Democratic president. Like a perfectly regular Democratic president who also confounded the founding fathers. So that's my point about disruption. It didn't create what maybe we thought it would initially, a whole series of little Barack Obamas in their Ivy League suits running for office. You saw him try. Cory Booker was like, oh, me too. Nope. <laughs> right? I mean, you, like, you saw the people try. But, and I, you see President Obama even now saying, I'm going to get the new Barack Obamas and Michelle Obamas to run. And I'm like, this is so cute. No. But what he did, what he couldn't help to do because he's a problem, is he disrupted what the American state was. And in so disrupting it, it disrupts it for all the actors of the American state, which disrupts white people's whiteness, which is how John McCain picks Sarah Palin and then all of a sudden whiteness becomes not reading the paper and not graduating from college and having a teen pregnant daughter. Because before that had been blackness, but then in 2008 that became whiteness, right? Which was weird but then just kept descending. Because right now I think Sarah Palin, she had time in office, she was elected official, right? So we just keep going to Trump. So it disrupts what whiteness is, what even counts to be white, what it means to be white, right? Whiteness is we don't read, we don't believe in science, we hate colleges. Who are these white people? These are not, what, I, this is never, white, all the white people I knew were trying to go to college and read things and believe in science. And they told you they made science. And if you was black and trying to do science, they were like, no. Now they're like, no science. We don't do science. We don't, I don't mean all white people. I mean this thing that's going on with whiteness. Right, okay. Right, okay. So it was disruptive, and I don't know what happens next. I don't, because it's disruptive. Some of it looks like things we've seen before in history. Some of it looks very different. And there's TikTok, so who knows? Thank you so much. <laughs> we have a question here. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Lincoln. I'm a political science and history student here. Uh, because your name is Lincoln, I think. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I was named after my mom's one of my mom's students. She was a teacher, so. <laughs> but I mean, you are a political science and history student named Lincoln. That yeah. is like. <laughs> thank you. I I'm not going to forget that. I'm yeah. gonna, I'm, you're going to be part of the, the, the story later. Okay, go ahead. So my question is in relation to Obama's campaign rhetoric when trying to appeal to black voters uh, about his uh, kind of attempts that he made to push for policies to support black communities and advance black communities compared with Trump's uh, 2016 and 2020 campaign rhetoric mm -hmm. where he was kind of directly calling out to the black community, saying it very directly, um, and especially in the wake of Black Lives Matter in 2020, he took that very direct on and, and kind of said, this is what we did in our administration. Mm -hmm. And he listed all of these priorities and actions, even if just rhetorically, that's what he was saying, compared to Obama's somewhat silence on this. So you know, kind of how do you make of this issue, comparing it to Trump's legacy with Obama's leadership and executive and policy actions? Look, I, I think they have to be separate, right? 
So I was talking a little bit about this with students earlier. Um, there, I think we can simply assess empirically using a whole series of either economic measures or whatever the measures are, right? We can assess is a community, is a group of, or, you know, are a group of people doing better or worse under any given presidency, right? And that doesn't even necessarily attribute to the president, right? Like, so you could be doing better under President X, right, than you are under President Y. It doesn't mean it was the president that did it, right? And even if a whole community is doing better or worse, doesn't even necessarily mean that you feel it in your household, right? So, but, but those are empirical questions that are all answerable, right? So um, we talked about this in the context of the unemployment rate. So often during the um, Obama years, particularly the second term, because the first term was so marred by what was happening with the, the downturn. But by the second term, you know, there was a question about, well, how are black folks doing to just unemployment? I'm not even gonna do wages or anything, right? And black unemployment was double that of white unemployment, right? Just was during that whole second term. It was also double, black unemployment was also double white unemployment during all previous presidencies back to 1970, Democrats and Republicans, right? So under Carter, under Reagan, under, right? So this seems to be a more structural feature of the American system um, and probably mostly the job market system and the incarceral system. Look, <laughs> the question of whether or not um, a president's policies did well or badly by a community was visited upon Hillary Clinton, right? So the, um, the Clinton years of mass incarceration were 100% critically important to how black people felt about and continue to feel about Hillary Clinton, fair or not fair, right? Like whether or not she should take that, she took that, right? In the sense of like that absolutely was part of the discourse um, for black folks. The most beloved recent presidents for black voters are President Clinton, who accelerated mass incarceration and signed the Welfare Reform Act, which generated, even as there was like a uh, improvement for middle class blacks, generated new levels of poverty. And Barack Obama, who was about as good as most Democratic presidents, right? Like he wasn't, the, the curve, the economic curve wasn't steeper for black folks. Um, the one curve that was, was um, education, um, but that was also probably more structural, right? Like, I don't think Obama sent people to college. In fact, part of the argument that President Trump is able to then build on is that he actually screws up college. So President Obama screwed, um, or I don't know if it's him, but the DOE screws up parent plus loans, um, sort of towards the end of the, um, of the second term. So they uh, create a situation where parent plus loans are now um, based on credit worthiness. And that has exactly the effect that you would think that it has, <laughs> right? Um, and that has a devastating effect on historically black colleges, which is how we get that early photo, right, in the Trump White House of all those historically black college presidents, right, in that room. Okay. These are empirical questions that we could go piece by piece through. But I just want to suggest that I think democracy is something different than that. Voters are who they are. Um, they know some things, they don't know other things. But they make choices based on how they understand the world, right? What they want. And usually it's not like, I want this particular policy. Sometimes it is, but a lot of times it's not. When a group of voters choose a president and stand by that president, I, I'm, not, like, I'm not so much down with the what's the matter with Kansas. Why are these Kansas voters voting for Republicans? Because they want the Republicans to win. And whether or not I think that is their self-interest rightly understood is really kind of irrelevant. It's a democracy. <laughs> they picked a candidate. For me, um, part of the beef that I had with Cordell West over the years is he was like, Obama's bad for black people. And I'm like, maybe, but you know, we picked him. Like by like 96%, like that's, that's the one, that's the one we picked. So if you, if you care and respect the role of black folks as citizens, then whatever the reason, whether it's to just confound the founding fathers or whether it's because you believe there'll actually be criminal justice reform or whatever, that, 
that choice has to be understood as how people in a democracy are reflecting their own sense of self-interest. So no matter what Trump said about policy, and I would say actually this is, I, I would actually make it more true about um, um, George W. Bush, who was a big tent guy, right? You, you were not going to have black folks as a majority, not gen every black folks, see you as seeing them when you disrespect President Obama. Full stop. Like, that's the guy we picked. Totally cool to run against him, but you're gonna have to show him some respect. And you did. You said he was a secret Muslim, which a person can't even be because Islam is a public religion. So if somebody ain't like hitting the floor five times a day, like you can totally be a secret Christian because you're just like, Jesus in my heart, but you can't be a secret Muslim. <laughs> it's a public religion. Man is over here eating, you know, pork at the Iowa State Fair. He just like, if he is a secret Muslim, he's a really bad one. <laughs> so like you, like you disrespected the guy we picked, right? And, and so let me just say, when Hillary Clinton does the, the basket of deplorables thing, right? She's disre disrespecting the guy that the Republican primaries pick. You, if you want, that's all cool if you run it against those voters. But if you think you're gonna get those voters, then you can't basket of deplorables them. You just like, nah, right? And so for me, um, Trump had this really interesting, very long history with black men because of hip hop. Right? Like the number of eight, right? Just go on, but just, just roll it back in your head to the 80s and the early 90s, right? And like Trump is in every other damn lyric, right? Which is part of how you could, like his swagger is not the I've been shut out of room swagger. His swagger is like, I'm in all y'all songs, <laughs> right? So I get like, I'm in all y'all songs and Kanye over here talking to my ear. So, so I get, and he's like, I've got, and I've got, Alma Rosa helping me to understand what helped with the parent plus loans because she totally understood that and the HBCU. So I get why he's like, all right, I'm making a ploy. It, but then when he does stuff like, what do you have to lose? Like, 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 oh, I got a list here, <laughs> right? Sorry, I'm coming to the end of this. And it's important to note that he increases his vote share in 2020. So you're not going to get, <laughs> black folks have been 80 plus percent to 90 percent with the Democratic Party since Kennedy, right? Really, Johnson. So if, if you, by his second term, right, Trump is back to historical Republican norms with black voters, right? You're not going to, look, John McCain, had he not been running against Barack Obama, very possibly could have increased vote share. Mitt Romney damn sure could have. It almost happened because Mitt Romney has a very compelling story to tell about race because his daddy, George Romney, was the shit. Y'all know about George Romney and the housing memo? Ooh. George Romney, who was the secretary of HUD under Nixon, who was the first secretary of HUD after the Fair Housing Act, who wrote the memo that called white suburbs a noose around the black inner city and said, we will now withhold all federal funding from any city or locality or municipality that does not affirmatively further fair housing? Listen, and his mama had run for Congress as a little, look, and Mormons are kind of like black people and then they got like thrown out of the country. And listen, <laughs> George, listen, Mitt Romney had a story to tell, and he had passed Obamacare in Massachusetts before Obamacare was Obamacare, but he was running against Barack Obama. So speed bump in history, because we just weren't, you just, you weren't, we weren't, you weren't like, you, we weren't gonna vote against Michelle's husband. That's just like, I'm sorry, I'm, no. So, so for Trump, he, he's such a genius on how to move media, this is why I left media, because I couldn't believe media was not seeing what was happening, he was so good at it. He's still so good at it. But I don't think he's a genius at, in that communication piece, right? When I, he's very good at media, but I wouldn't put him as a top narrative storyteller about the American project in the way that, for example, I would say Reagan was, right? Reagan, Shining City on the Hill, is of a different valence than Make America Great Again, right? It just, 
even to understand that nostalgia operates differently for people who were enslaved, right? That when you talk about it being, and again, we're always like, when was that before, right? So that whether you mean it or not, like you have to have that ear. He doesn't, he's got a hip hop ear, he really does, which is the swagger where he's like, bring it, do it, what? I got COVID, we going for a ride. I mean, that's the most like, <laughs> right? That's like the most hip hop thing. Like it's very like, hmm. But, but you, couldn't, you couldn't do that and disrespect President Obama. Like, those things were not. But there's a lot of room for a Republican who decides that they want to go big tent. Not pander. Pander doesn't work. But actual, genuine big tent, I think there's a lot of room. Because I do think that prior to Barack Obama's presidency, there was a lot of questions about the ways in which black Democrats felt taken for granted. But you, you will not get, you just are not going to get there through a disrespect of President Obama. You could, you could only get there through a narrative storytelling that, that brings the black citizen story along. And you can't get there with just policy. Just Melissa, you have given us such an intellectual journey here. It's just <laughs> been from communication, representation, policy making, narrative. This has been so instructive. Thank you. Please join me in giving Dr. Harris a warm hand. It has truly been a delight to have you here to share your assessment of President Obama's leadership and legacy. And we hope to continue the conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and I will say, I, you know, I know how I talk, like everything I say that I believe every word of it, but it's all actually just hypothesizing, right? So I think the other thing that's really important for like scholars, again, to go back to your question of what is a legacy, I don't know. And, and, and we know that President Obama's green screening us, right? So, so I'm reading through from, so I just want to say this is like, like the way that we generate hypotheses, right? Is we put them out there with like the sense of like, this is how it is, but then we should spend a lot of time actually attempting to falsify our own hypotheses. So everything I said could be wrong. Like every single bit of it might be wrong, but that like the idea of like a generative space to have an analysis. So like I disagree with some of what was happening on the early panels, but it was also like really generative, right? And so I just wanna also encourage that as you all are going through the next few days that like there isn't any one person, no matter how close or how far or what position they're standing in that has the story, right? That's ideally what this kind of space is. Thank you. We have had a full day today. We'll be continuing tomorrow. The first plenary on foreign policy is at 9.30. Tonight, we still have um, an exhibit in the Emily Lowe Gallery, When We All Stand, about social activism and grassroots mobilization to affect policy change. We also have a reception in the Memorial Hall Cafe, which is right next door. We hope you'll join us there, and we look forward to continuing the discussions tomorrow. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you.